forward to the cloud. I'm pretty excited about this lecture. I actually did some research on this in undergrad. Um, so I have somewhat of an understanding of it. So yeah. All right. So today we're going to be talking about women in computer science. Um, but before we talk about that, I want to ask you guys a question. I want you to describe what a computer nerd looks like. A computer nerd. A computer nerd, like a like a geek, a nerd, a guy. Sure, somebody like me, or it could be a woman. Okay. Well, what else? The glasses. Yeah, the, the certain types of hair. Like a like a like a computer. Like imagine a movie where there's a character and they work with computers. What is the character gonna look like? Youngish. Youngish. Uh, acne. Acne. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, small build. Small build. Yeah, not like a big hunky guy. Yeah, right. Small build. Um, so I, yeah, please describe a stereotype. Uh, Best. Uh, yeah. Right. They they dress a certain uh, way. Yeah. Go ahead. Again, again, again. Um, criminal minds? No. Uh, because there's a oh, criminal minds. Yeah, yeah. And I, I haven't seen it, but I've heard of it. Yeah. So she's got the computer. Yeah. Okay. I mean, she's a Yeah, right. Okay, so. Yeah, right. So, computer nerd. Right. So, we have glasses, certain types of hair. They dress a certain way. They have a lot of acne. Uh, <laughs> so you know, I'm a computer nerd. What? Well, like, think about it. Have you ever seen a movie with like the hacker character, or like the character in charge of the computers? Like, and then what does that character look like? You know, I mean, nowadays they might just look like a normal person, but if you look at certain movies, they have like a trope, right? Focused. Focused. Yeah, it's it's like a good. Yeah. yeah, yeah, not the party type. Introverted. Yeah. Okay. This is great. This is a good. This is this is beautiful. This is what I want. I wanted you to describe to me. When I say computer nerd, there's a so stereotype that's coming. Brilliant in everything that touches science and computer. Sociology maybe a little Yeah. Perfect. That's yeah. Excellent. So they're very smart. They're very focused, but uh, kind of. Maybe naive. a little naive or not social. not social, kind of an introverted field. Okay. Yeah, but they're like, but like, they're not like, they're not going to be the center of attention at the party. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're focused on their work. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. So I want you guys to think of this stereotype that we've come and described together. Just keep put that in a little filing cabinet in your brain. It's going to come up in like 30, 40 minutes. Okay. Cool. So let's begin talking about the history of women in computer science. And to begin, I would like to describe two very important figures. And now these aren't the only two important figures in the history of women in computer science. Uh, for example, um, you have that movie that was mentioned like on Monday, Hidden Figures. Those women were incredibly important. Uh, but today I'm going to be focusing on two figures. So the first <clears throat> is Lady Ada Lovelace. So she was a British woman. Um, she lived from 1815 to 1852, so not that long of a life, actually. She was the daughter of Lord Byron. If any of you guys know English history, he's that eccentric guy that died in Greece fighting for uh, Greek independence. Um, yeah, so that's his daughter. And uh, some consider her to be the first programmer. Now, what do I mean by that? So you can see a dude on the screen. His name is Charles Babbage, right? So Charles Babbage created this prototype, or at least this theory of this machine called the analytical engine. And what you can think of, the analytical engine, you can almost think of it as like a really beefy calculator. So a normal calculator, I mean, back then they didn't have even like the basic calculators today. They had like abacus and stuff like that. But what this could allow you to do is make pretty complicated mathematical equations and punch them into the machine and compute them. So if you needed something like 
five times x cubed times cosine three over the square root of what, like you could do that on this machine, right? So this is something that Charles Babbage came up with. He didn't actually create it in his lifetime because of budgetary and uh, material constraints, but he worked alongside Ada Lovelace. Now, Lovelace thought of this machine a little bit differently than Babbage. So Babbage really, I mean, it depends on the account you're looking at, but a lot of sources say that Babbage looked at this machine and he saw it as a very beefy calculator. And that by itself is incredible that you could have a calculator mechanically compute something that a mathematician would have to sit and write down, right? So that by itself is incredible. Ada looked at this thing and she said, this could be more than just a calculator. This could allow you to perform a set of instructions. You could create an algorithm and then you could tune this thing to not just come up with mathematical uh, answers, but also to do much, much more. And she was working within the theory of this device that again, was never really um, put into creation. But a lot of people consider her to be the first programmer because let's think about it. I've, I've touched upon this in previous lessons. A computer is essentially just a really, really powerful calculator. And we manipulate this calculator to do many different things for us, to talk with our friends over Zoom or to read emails or whatever. But she was the first to understand that if you have a powerful enough computer with a powerful enough display, you can essentially have it do so much more than just basic calculations. So she was incredibly, um, I'd say, novel in her field. Yeah. The, the diagram for the computation, the mm -hmm. engine, uh, and maybe I missed something. I don't, I don't hear everything you said. Okay. Uh, was there an engine already? No. no. So, so, so this. I think maybe this is her. her yeah. Uh, Hi. Yeah, so uh, perfect. Yeah, so this picture here, this is page, this is like note G of a few notes that she wrote. Um, so, I mean, I, I know it's not entirely legible, it's, and that's okay. But um, so this is Charles Babbage, right? This, this dude right here, this guy. And this is the machine that he purported to make. He never actually was able to make it because it would be too expensive. No, but, but he at least theorized it, it, its existence. So he thought of the idea for this machine, right? Charles Babbage. Is it Babbage or Babbage? Babbage, like cabbage with a B at the beginning. So he never built it. He never built it, he theorized it. So he sketched it over. He sketched it, he discussed how it would work, what kind of parameters it would take in. <laughs> so even though we never actually made it, uh, Lovelace worked pretty closely with him. And based on how he described the way the machine would work, she came up with these really creative ways of manipulating this device. It's essentially like one caveman finds wood and figures out we can build fires with it. But then another caveman comes along sees the wood and says, oh, we can build houses too. It's the same device. It's just an entirely different application. So we're not entirely different, but somewhat different. Yeah. So the next figure I'd like to talk about is Grace Hopper. So has anybody here heard of Grace Hopper? Or perhaps like seen her portrait before? No? Admiral Grace Hopper. So she lived from 1906 to 1992. Uh, so she lived a, a long and very famous life. Um, now, she was, I think if there was one word I could use to describe uh, Grace Hopper, <clears throat> it would be patriot. So think about it. She was born in 1906. So by the time World War II came around, she was roughly 32, 33, something like that. Right. So she actually wanted to enlist in the Navy, but they wouldn't let her because she was too old um, at the time. So the thing is, though, she was a genius. She was a mathematical like, a genius, right? 
So she enlisted in the Navy Reserves, and then the Navy and Harvard collaborated to create this machine called Mark I. So you can see Mark I on the right side here. You can see it's this, uh, I mean, these, these series of tubes and these little glass boxes and some buttons behind them, whatever. But that is Harvard Mark I, which is a groundbreaking device because it's one of the first modern day computers. So nowadays, when you look at a computer, you see something like this, right? But I want you guys to tell me, if we were in the 1970s and someone said the word computer, what does that computer look like? Can someone tell me? It has, it has Huge. It has little discs. And little discs. Metal. Yeah, it's all metal. Yeah. And it's, it takes up like, it's like a, it's like a semi. Like it takes up the whole room. You need air conditioners. Yeah, you need, exactly. You need air conditioners on blast because this thing is like a space heater with a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of the computational power of this thing. Oh, wow. Yeah. So this thing, the size of like a semi truck is absolutely completely demolished in performance by this. So that's kind of insane, right? But back then, she was a part of the team that worked with the Navy at Harvard that created this first computer, the Harvard Mark I. She was also responsible for the creation of something called COBOL, C-O-B-O-L. And this is a programming language. Now, why is this so important? I forgot what COBOL stands for. Um, I forgot what it stands for. But she was integral to its creation. And something important about COBOL is that it is machine independent. So if you bought or created one of these gigantic machines, right, these big, big, big computers, some of them would require you to use their own programming language, their own set of instructions. So you would buy this semi-truck machine, and then you would have to write in a language built specifically for that device. But she came up with the idea, what if there was a language ubiquitous across all devices? COBOL is still used today. There's a lot of banking systems that rely on old languages like COBOL because it might not be as fast as some of the stuff that's come out today, but it is reliable. It does what it needs to do. So she was, I think, by the time of her death, she was a rear admiral in the Navy. Um, again, like an like a, a, a incredibly gifted person in terms of intellect. Um, and just now, I mean, there's like, like, I think like if you're if, if you're a female computer science major, there's a networking event called like the Grace Hopper Computing Conference or something like that. Like she's a big name in the field. Yeah. But funnily enough, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. It's just been helpful. Speaking of names, she must have had a profound name like Grace Hopper. Oh yeah, yeah, Grace Hopper. I mean, yeah, Babbage Hopper. Like some of these names are pretty funny. But um, common business oriented language. Common, common business oriented language. Okay, there you go. That's what COBOL stands for. Common business oriented language. Straight to the point. She should have, uh, she should have a picture of the restaurant. Yeah, she does. She should, she should, there should be portraits of her in places, right? I think, I think um, she taught at Yale or something for a few years. So there's a, I think the computing school either at, at Yale or Brown or something is named after her, which is good. But the problem is, is that I don't, I don't think these women have enough recognition. And this isn't like your fault. But none of you had heard of either of these figures. And admittedly, before I researched women in CS, I hadn't heard of these figures. I think I had heard of Grace Hopper a few times, but I didn't know anything about her history. I didn't know about her contributions. So why is that the case? So to understand why that's the case and why Getting educated in the late 2010s, I wasn't learning about figures like Hopper and Lovelace. In order to understand why that's the case, we need to rewind a little bit. So let's start in between like 1940 and 1969. So let's talk about how women broke into the field because the truth is that computer science used to be a female dominated field. Yeah, which some of you might not expect. Really? Yes, it was a female-dominated field. Yeah. So, well, how did that happen? Well, 
And it's a combination of factors. One, World War II. So what happened during World War II? I mean, exactly. Men were off across the pond fighting the Germans. Okay. So there, all the men were away. So industrial jobs had to be taken up by women. So here on the top right hand of the screen, we have, I think there was something like an aircraft part or a tank part or something. But two women, the women started working at factories and women started picking up parts of industry that were essential to mobilization, right? So, I mean, this I think is actually an English uh, poster, this poster here, but um, women were essential to the war because even if by and large they weren't firing the weapons, they were making these things. They were responsible for actually making these. And not only that, but because of the importance of stuff like battleships and bombers, these things require something. They require precision. When you strike a target, you're striking them from thousands of feet up in the air or from miles away on a boat. So you need to make sure you're arcing your gun in just the right way so that your shell hits the target or at an angle where it gets past defenses or whatever. So this requires precision. Precision requires math. And what better way to do quick math than with a computer, right? So really the effects of World War II were twofold. One, it helped kick women into the industry, right? So not just clerical work, but also like hammering stuff and figuring out office bureaucracy and blah, blah, blah. And two, it necessitated the real birth of modern computing. Okay. Another piece of context that's important to understand uh, how women came to be so important to computer science at the beginning is that they already had experience. Now, they didn't have experience working with Harvard Mark I, obviously, because that hadn't existed yet. But if you looked during the 1920s and 1930s, if there was a warehouse somewhere where everybody was just sitting at a typewriter for some reason, maybe a newspaper or like, a, like some kind of office, whatever, by and large, the people who were at those typewriters were women. Typological fields or typograph or typography, I think it's typography, not typography, type, whatever. Typographic fields were dominated by women. So if you had a job that involved typing at a keyboard, most likely it was inhabited by a woman. Yeah. When I went to high school, I'm a little older than everybody here. High schools have three courses. I think commercial. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Mostly commercial meant that we would be doing mostly women, that we would be prepared for this kind of secretary work, mm -hmm. where the academics were the ones that went to college. It was it was like two two levels. Yeah, right. Yeah. Totally different. Yeah. So it's there. So yeah. there was, it was, this is part of that was part of it. Yeah, exactly. You know, so our culture and our training, our school was geared to this. It was. And you used a key word there, which is secretary. Even now, when people say the word secretary for a lot of people, and this isn't necessarily a fault of someone, it just is, it's just a fact of our society. When someone says the word secretary, oftentimes the thing that a woman comes to mind immediately, because the fact is that secretary jobs are inhabited mostly by women. Secretary jobs mean typing stuff. So when computing became a big thing and then they needed people to type. They, they were they already knew how to do that. Yeah, because we when we were in school, they gave us typing. Exactly. Curriculum. Exactly. So women already knew how to type at typewriters. So this brings us to the dynamic of hardware versus software. Now in the 50s and even into the 60s, uh, when people were figuring out how to assemble smart computers which now, I mean, we can look back and think that those were inefficient or whatever, but they're pretty impressive, right? So when people in the 50s were figuring out how do we build a computer, that is a question of electrical engineering and physics. These are fields that were dominated by men because men were mostly represented in these parts of academia. 
So at universities, most electrical engineers, if at some schools, if not all electrical engineers were men, all physicists were men. So then when these men went off and started building computers, they were responsible for hardware. Now what hardware is, it's the brick. It's this thing. I can throw hardware at you. That's the difference. Software is like the soul, which is a little corny, but you get what I'm saying. Hardware is the actual components. It's the electricity. It's like the wiring and the chemicals and whatever. The physical. The physical, exactly. But software is the intellectual. So here's what happened. Man inhabited fields necessary to create hardware. So they started building computers. And then they figured, well, we need somebody to just regurgitate a bunch of instructions into these machines. So who could we get that would be really good at that? Women, because they already know how to type. So we'll have women who already have experience typing stuff, we'll have them be in charge of software. And this wasn't just typing stuff. So here, I mean, you can see a woman, she's sketching out stuff, she'll type stuff out of this machine. But women also built punch cards, which you may have seen before. A punch card is, this card is bigger than this, that you feed into a machine. And based on where the holes are punched into the card, the computer will do something different. It's they comparable. Time, they were time cards. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, time card. It's like a time, it is exactly a time card. Yeah. We use them. Yeah, right. So if you, um, my first job used them too, actually. Um, if you have ever been to like an antique store, you'll find maybe like, There'll be those like little players that like the it's like a spinning metal oh, thing and little yeah, yeah yeah like little spinning thing with the little barbs and it like it plinks and it ding 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 yeah so those are punch cards punch cards so imagine that but like it's telling you how to like shoot like a bunker somewhere that's 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 what it is so ironically the initial structure of this dynamic was sexist it was just oh women couldn't figure out how to build these computers we'll just put but they can run them, they can build the software. So there, hardware and software were not seen as equally important. Even though today we know for a fact that they are, it was more so seen that, oh, hardware, this is the work of ingenuity. This is stuff that requires training at a university. Software, yeah, I mean, it's just, you have to just type out instructions, it's not that much. But quickly did they realize software is just as important. If you have an idiot writing software, your computer will run like an idiot built it. It doesn't matter how good the hardware is. Garbage in, garbage. Garbage in, garbage out. I, wow, I'm impressed. I actually heard that phrase yesterday in a data science class. But you are shocked. That's insane. Wow. Garbage in, garbage out. Yeah, you can have the most beautiful, elegant machine. But if you have a monkey at a typewriter writing your code, it's not going to run very well. But these women not only had experience in typography, turns out they had a knack for software design. Probably because they used it. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So women, <laughs> so when I say women dominated computer science, it's not that they dominated like the engineering of hardware, but they were a critical part to computer firms because you needed experienced women who had experience typing and writing software to make it so that your computer would run fast and cleverly, right? And suddenly you started seeing women making bank. Like women were making a decent amount of money working at these firms. And then you have important figures in different software feats. Like for example, let's bring up hidden figures again. That NASA trip to the moon wouldn't have been done without that woman. So this is all good and dandy, right? So seems like things are off to a good start. Um, so what happened? Because when I said that computer science was once a female dominated field, a lot of you looked as though I said, uh, I don't know, the sky is purple, right? Like it was like silly. So 70s to 90s, we saw a hostile redefinition of what a computer nerd is. So what I mean by that is that in the 70s to 90s, 
when you looked at somebody working at a computer firm or when somebody who worked with computers was represented in the media. They were not a woman, they were something else. So let's talk about that. So let's think back to our description. So interestingly, this didn't exactly go the way I thought it would. At the very beginning, I asked you guys to describe a computer group, right? I asked you, what, is, what do they look like? What does he look like? You guys didn't really fall from my trap because I expected you to say it was a dude. Yes. It was a guy with the big spectacles and the hair and the acne and blah, 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 small friend, whatever. Okay. That's what I expect. You guys actually, you, you guys avoided my trap. So well done. But normally it would look kind of like this guy. Right? Yep. Computer nerd. Has anybody seen Napoleon Dynamite by any chance? It's a comedy movie. Well, that's Napoleon's brother, Chip, and he's a computer nerd. In the movie, he is represented as like a guy who sits in front of his computer for hours a day. Like he, met his he met his girlfriend online stuff like that i mean look and you look at him he's got the small build the spectacles the receding hairline it doesn't exactly look like he's going to be dancing in the middle of the party right so where did that come from because i just described to you a world where women are in a firm and they're typing out instructions for computers so how did we go from that to this so <clears throat> the truth of it is <clears throat> wow, teaching yelling. So it's, it's a it's quite an exercise of the vocal, whatever. Anyway, so no, I'm good. But computers kick started because of World War II, right? World War II meant that the United States military wanted to research like groundbreaking technology. And that's where like the Manhattan Project came from. The, the atomic bomb came from the United States looking for technology that, that would give them the upper hand in conflict. So World War II ends, the Third Reich is deposed. Then we get the Cold War. Cold War features the same thing. So we're not like nuking the Russians, thank God, because then we wouldn't be sitting here talking. Um, but can somebody tell me what happened in the Cold War? What, it's a two word phrase. It's a blank race. Arms. Arms race, exactly. So here, that's not just like how many nukes can I build in this amount of time? That's not just, oh, I have 1,000 nukes and you have 500 nukes, which means if we go to war, uh, you're more dead than I am, which is actually not true because both of you are dead, but like <laughs> it doesn't matter how many. But there was an arms race and it wasn't just how many nukes can I stockpile. It was also what kind of technology can I acquire? Stuff in jet fighters or you know, stealth planes or, you know, different espionage tools. How can we acquire technology that gives us a leg up against those damn Russians, right? And the Russians thought exactly the same thing. Computers then weren't just like a part of that, they were all of it. For example, mutually assured destruction. Can somebody tell me what this means? Mutually assured destruction or MAD. Does anybody know what that means? If any one party in a conflict uses nuclear weapons, everybody dies. Pretty much, yeah. So if the Soviet Union, for example, detects it's a reciprocal thing. It's a screw you. If we go to war, everyone dies. It's a <clears throat> there were sensors across Russia, the United States, England, Norway, even. And these sensors were, they existed only to pick up seismological readings. So that is, when the earth is shaking, why is it shaking? Is there an earthquake? Are the tectonic plates scraping against each other? Did somebody set off a nuke? If they set off a nuke, where did they set off the nuke? Computers became a part of that. And if you triggered a computer incorrectly, it would notify the wrong people that something happened and then something terrible could happen. But computers were a part of this. Computer weren't, computers weren't just like a background part, but they helped organize the logistics of warfare, espionage, research, all that stuff. Computers were the center point, almost as much as if not more than nuclear technology. Because yeah, nukes are cool, they're not cool. Nukes are explosive, but how are you going to aim the stupid nuke? 
I mean, no one's going to fly it up to space. You got to get a computer to tell you where to shoot it. So we also saw the creation of different consumer electronics companies. So IBM, Microsoft, Apple. Uh, what you can see on the slide here is actually what their logos used to look like. I don't know if that IBM logo, I'm pretty sure they've always used it. But that's, I think, the first Microsoft logo. And that's the first Apple logo, which looks like a, it looks like a beer, like, it looks like an indie beer company or something. <laughs> but um, yeah, so Apple, Microsoft, IBM, which are all firms that still exist today, got their heyday in the 70s, actually. So computers became really important. Computer firms were becoming really important. Before Microsoft and Apple got big, IBM was big. I think they had, they got like trust busted by the way. Really? Yeah, they got they got they got that's all we heard of. they got yeah. shot down by the, the federal trade commission or something right like the, yeah like they got trust busted right so they were that big okay the only name do. yeah right so now that's the thing these corporations and not just these guys plenty of other companies across america and across the world are developing computers for the government for consumers for businesses so like hey help your secretary work faster whatever Organize your taxes, who cares? These companies didn't want to look girly. If that sounds stupid, it's because it is. So what does that mean? So on this slide, I decided to include some advertisements. Can somebody tell me something you notice about one of the advertisements? Like maybe the, the left one. What do you guys notice about the left She's one? She's very sexual. She's very sexual, right? She's like. Okay, what else? This left one here. This is a computer? I see you scoff. Why? Why do you, what's, what's so funny? So how, do, how is this woman depicted? It's more her on the picture than the It's more her on the picture. Yeah, that's one thing. Young and beautiful. Young and beautiful. There's definitely more of her on the computer, yeah. So in other words, it's saying she's the computer. Well, not really. I wouldn't or say she, she's the operator of the computer. She's not even. And no, she, no. And we're attracting young people to the field. Well, we're, okay, we're attracting young people to the field. But what about her character? If she could do it, anyone could do it. That's one thing. If she can do it, anyone can do it. Okay, that's one thing. How about this? Based on the quote that the ad gives us, this is a computer, how would you guess her nature? Is she, is she someone super familiar with computers who can program your taxes in 10 seconds, or is she completely naive and stupid and blah, 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 blah? She's the worker. She's really, she's just naive. She's mm -hmm. almost depicted as just like she's naive. Not, she's not going to be behind the brain. No, exactly. She's like a naive little girl. And this is some insane alien object to her, which is a far cry from what I already described to you. Most women in computer science do not look like that. I mean, maybe they look like it, but they didn't talk like this. They wouldn't sit down and go, this is a computer? Like, no. And you brought up an interesting point, which is if she can do it, anyone can. That ad wouldn't work with like- Today. Well, no, I mean, it wouldn't work today. But the ad wouldn't work if you had like, um, who was that physicist, like a really famous physicist? Stephen Hawking. Yeah. If you had an ad that said Stephen Hawking can do it, anyone can. I'd be like, oh, okay, I can't, like, I'm not as smart as that guy, so <laughs> this ad doesn't work. The ad only works because it depicts her as stupid. And she's stupid because she's a woman. That's essentially, like, the thesis of the ad. It's it is very demeaning. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, okay, now look at the middle ad. The middle ad is a lot more, it's not so much like the ditzy naivety of, of the woman, but it's more so just the, like, sex sounds, right? So here, like, they're describing a secretary routine. That's what kind of dependable, compatible. That's what the secretary does. I didn't even notice that. Yeah. So the, these are the double entendre here is that these are adjectives that can supposedly describe a woman, but it can also describe this weird little machine. I don't even know what the hell it does. I also like to point out if we sat here and like counted how many pixels this thing took up, it would be like a fourth of this. <laughs> um, and then finally on the right, we have two bytes are better than one. TMS 9916-bit microcomputer. All right, here, again, this is actually twofold. One, it's showing women as just being like sexy, whatever. Two, computer nerd. 
Look at that. They didn't, this isn't just some dude. This is likely a depiction trying to show the advertisee what a computer operator looks like. And that's not a female, it's a guy. So why did I decide to show you advertisements? Because who's putting out these advertisements? The, company. the companies. And if nothing else is indicative of their internal culture, it'd be this. So it was around this time that a lot of computer firms were shot into stardom because they worked with the government, they worked for consumer tech, they worked tech businesses. <clears throat> around this time too, in order to maintain their supposed prestige, they tried to make themselves look more masculine, which again, I know sounds silly, but it's how they operated. But we don't consider nerd sexy. This one is sexy because get to the <laughs> I guess. <laughs> well, it's supposed to be if you have this machine, you'll get right. women. <laughs> yeah, right. Two bites. This is like a yeah, 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 something like that. It's, it's not a sex uh, sublimation. It's that. a very, it's not a very subtle ad. That's all I'll say. Right. Yeah, right. So with the with the rise of these different firms, they did not want to look effeminate, which is as stupid as it sounds. If I'm sounding like I'm talking in stupid terms, it's because I'm playing their game. So programming, this is the last thing I want to touch on for this section. Programming can be an isolating job. Think about it. When you program, are you a school teacher who works with hundreds of people per day? Are you a mayor who has like people like working underneath them? And, you know, like what, are you like a police officer who stops and talks? No. You sit at a cubicle, you type three hours. Is this really real today? I mean, nowadays it's not so like monolithic, I hope. <laughs> um, but it can be a kind of isolating job. Now, one thing you guys did describe when I asked you to describe what a computer nerd looks like, you said isolated or at least introverted, especially like Vivian, you were describing someone who's like kind of recedes they don't really they're not like loud and boisterous and in your face they're more focused they're like that little guy that you put on before yes the kick yeah it's him right so programming can be an isolating job some people love right now this slide let's i want to i want us to stop and i want us to think about what does it mean to be masculine right and this is entirely subjective it depends on what culture you're looking at this from. But if we were to speak about like Western notions of what it means to be masculine or a man, it means to be kind of stoic. You don't let your emotions flow out of you, you bottle them in. Independent, so you're somebody who can just, and I'm not saying I subscribe to this, I'm just trying to say what different cultural values we've assigned to masculinity. But someone who's stoic, they don't show their emotions. Someone who's independent, they can lead, they can work alone. Somebody who uses their brain. Somebody who doesn't care about the opinions of others. So the thing is, the bottom line is that, you know, you have your like 20 year old dude in 1980, whatever. He just got out of college. He wants to figure out a way to show everybody he's a big strong man. He can wear a suit. He can be a big bodybuilder and work at like some like merger corporation in, in Manhattan. He could be, again, he could be a bodybuilder. That's how he's a man. Enacting his masculinity is working out. But another way you could show everybody that you're a guy is by displaying other attributes like independence or intelligence or whatever. So, or not caring about appearances. So what happened is the reason we think of computer nerds or at least a lot of people think of computer nerds as that like unkempt, isolated dude with big spectacles, is because suddenly people who fell into that category saw themselves really fitting into this field. It's a field where you sit at a desk for eight hours and you don't converse with anyone around you. You don't need to care about what other people think. There are over 100 women there. Here? It's 22 percent rows. There are 20 uh, on the right, uh, another oh, yeah. 50. Uh, and it looks like pretty much everyone in France is a woman. One, one man supervising. <laughs> <laughs> I 
actually didn't. I just pulled out like a random photo of like cubicles in the 80s, but that's kind of funny. I guess these are all women. There's there's one. He's, he's no, I would guess it's a supervisor. No, I, I would guess it's a supervisor. Most of them are women. Yeah, I don't see a single man. I think that, that might be a dude, actually. It's really hard for me to tell, but I think that might be a dude. But in any case, like, Men would join the army because they would show everybody in town they're big and strong and they're a warrior, right? Men could also join a computing firm and show everybody they're a man because they don't care about what other people think. So then that's why I included like sweatpants and sandals. This is kind of a hard topic to describe because I need to both try to explain to you what masculinity is, which everybody has their own like perception of that. But this is kind of where the computer nerd came from. You had suddenly in the 70s, these advertisements are coming out. It's like these attitudes are adopted within companies that being a programmer is manly. And that's a shift we saw, not just like in how they were advertised, but internal company culture became nerdy and masculine. Right? This is where the computer nerd came from. Uh, like software designer, programmer, computer specialist, technician, there's a few terms for it. But it was around this time that, you know, firms wanted to masculinize themselves that they started getting a big inflow of computer nerds, you know, that this dude, right? So this brings us to the modern day. So really what we see here is it's almost like a war over culture, right? Initially, women kind of broke into the field because, ironically, a sexist structure of hardware versus software enabled them to use their typographic skills to contribute to something that wasn't like this. It was actually like this, right? And then that kind of got co-opted because internal company culture shifted, right? Suddenly, companies wanted to perceive themselves as masculine, successful, and what have you. And suddenly you saw that like women were studying computer science a lot less. And there were a lot less women working in firms. I think, I think there was a shift where at some point, like 65 to 70% of programmers were women. And then at some point in the 1970s or 80s, that had dropped to like 15. It's insane. But that's also because women started to go to other fields. Yeah, that's true. A lot of them, but all, and that's because- shifted over to areas where they were not uh, previous more lawyers, more doctors, etc. Mm -hmm. Instead of all going to the, the secretary. That's true. Kind of, that's true. That's very true. I saw that in my generation. That's very true. There was a diversification yes. of career paths, but we also can't discount that a lot of them were pretty much just bullied out, you know. And, and that was part of it. Yeah, right. Exactly. And that brings us to the modern day. So I just described you stuff that was happening in the seventies and eighties. I showed you those old antiquated ads, right? So surely it's not that bad now. No, it is. It's, it is that bad. So let me give you two examples. In 2018, uh, there was a walkout at Google. So this isn't just like in one city. It wasn't just in like the Bay Area, the Bay Area of California. Across the world, this actually made headlines, Google employees didn't go to work. They instead protested. And they're protesting multiple reasons. Um, one was their, one of their execs was like, I think one of their, one of the Google executives was found to have like, like sexually abused a coworker like a few years back. And then instead of like pressing charges, uh, Larry Page, the CEO of Google had him quietly leave the company with a stipend. So he essentially was just like, okay, shh, shh, shh. get out of the company. I'll give you some money on your way out. And he then invested in his future ventures. So it was that and a topic or a concept called forced arbitration. Does anybody know what forced arbitration is? So forced arbitration is a policy that some corporations have, which is essentially as follows. If you have 
an altercation between yourself and a coworker, worthy enough to be taken to court, in order to work here, instead of taking that to court, you have to take it to private company lawyers, and we will sort it out internally. So it's like human resource. It is, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, HR, it's kind of HR's thing. So forced arbitration basically means, I don't know, if your, if your coworker punches you in the face, I mean, that might be different. But like, then I'd be like, okay, instead of taking him to court for assault, uh, we'll sit down in a conference room somewhere, you bring your lawyer, he'll bring his lawyer, and then we'll discuss consequences that exist within the company. Okay, what else does that mean? Forced arbitration pisses off a lot of people, especially in this crowd, because, it also applies to sexual harassment and sexual abuse. So if one coworker is sexually exploitative of another, it was Google's policy so that instead of taking that issue to court, like, hey, so-and-so broke me at a company party. Instead of taking that to court, you had to go to Google's lawyers and sort it out between you and the other party involved. So you couldn't press charges, you had to work within the company. And oftentimes the company wouldn't give you a satisfying nice. result. Exactly. This argue, this, I mean, uh, understandably made a lot of people upset. So they took to the streets, they're complaining about this. And it's not just that, it's not just the exact with a very rotten history. It's not just the forced arbitration. There's also that women would, women would go to work and the general work environment was like a toxic waste Like. I don't know, what, okay, I'll get to that in the next example. But like men would like, in front of women, they would be like, so who in the office would you sleep with first? Or, you know, like they'd like be very open or they would belittle them. It's this kind of like, like it's, it's like both the sexualization and then the infantilization of women. Like, oh, well, I mean, oh, let me handle this, sweetie. Like stuff like that. That was that general culture. And I don't really have any specific examples to tell you because I'm not a woman at Google. But this was also the case. It was a kind of toxic work environment. So this is 2018. A year later, we had the 2019 Riot Games walkout. So Riot Games is a company that is responsible for developing, I think, one of, if not the biggest video game um, on Earth right now. So this video game is called League of Legends. Um, League of Legends, it's a specific like, multiplayer game. Um, and Riot Games is responsible for developing it. They develop it, they market it, they do all the creative work, whatever. It's, it's their baby. Like it's made them so much money. So a year after the Google walkout, Riot Games has the same thing on a smaller scale because they're not as big as Google. So I think this was, I think it was just in LA because their headquarters are in Los Angeles, but there was a walkout. They were protesting forced arbitration because Riot also did forced arbitration. <clears throat> so I think I think Google may have ended its policy of forced arbitration. If you're interested in that, you should look that up. You should Google it, ironically. Um, I'm not sure, I don't think Riot has them. Riot still has a policy of forced arbitration. So if something happens to you at work, you don't take it to the court, you take it to a riot. Most companies do. Most, yeah, most companies do that. Yeah, it's very true. It's it's they don't yeah. Want it out there. Exactly. They don't want that dirt out there. Happens all the time. I mean, God, yeah, God helps us. Like Hollywood. 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 Yeah. Let me just say Hollywood. That's all I need to say. Yeah. <laughs> I was reading about it yesterday. It's brutal. It's terrible. So, yeah, same exact thing. It wasn't just the forced arbitration. And I don't think there were any like shady execs that we really know of. But at Riot Games, for example, multiple women had different experiences involving a list that their office passed around of like ranking the women in terms of attractiveness like the men would pass around the sheet and then you would write down like tally mark like basically treating women like 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 you know like objects. yeah exactly Sexual objects. yeah nobody wants that nobody wants to exist in a in an office space that does that <laughs> so this is as early as three years ago or really like two and a half years ago so we had all this stuff happen in the 80s where there was like the, the misogyny started becoming built into the structure of a lot of big tech corporations and it hasn't really gotten much better. 
if anything, it kind of warped itself and has transpired into this. So this last part, uh, I have a graph and a statistic. So this is as recent as like a year ago. This pie graph is from research conducted a year ago, in 2021. So this is asking why women leave the tech industry. So 30% of women say they leave the tech industry because of poor company culture, stuff like that attractiveness list, right? Let's see, 31% say dissatisfaction with a particular job, which could mean a few different things. I mean, they don't like the role they're working in, they want to work somewhere else, could have something to do with like a hostile work environment. 22% say that they're interested in a role outside of tech, and 10% say a lack of diversity. So this is my first pie graph for you. I'll leave it up for a second if you want to jot it down. Um, but even that there is 37% for company culture is pretty insane. That should be 10 or 5 or really zero, but I'm telling you that this pie graph would look differently from that, right? So then this last statistic, this is actually what I will, I think we're at the end of the lecture anyways. Yeah, this is what I'll leave you with. 18% of computer science degrees held in the United States are held by women. Only 18%. So for every 100 computer science degrees awarded that have been awarded to American citizens, 18 of them are women. Additionally, 50% of women who take a role in tech drop out by the age of 35. Again, this could be many different reasons, but what I've described to you is indicative of a few kind of glaring issues. I don't necessarily have a conclusion. I don't have like a, so what, or like how, what we can do, but at least I wanted to illustrate today the trends that we've seen over the years and some of those important notable figures that we've seen and how, their importance and the importance of their peers has been kind of discounted over time by people within the industry and outside. So yeah, that's, uh, that is today's lecture. If you have any questions, I'll stick around for a minute or two. I have a comment. What's the comment? First of all, just from my own experience and what I've seen in the science and the field, uh, our, our education system is not bringing up women or in general with math. Most of the people who I admired and had the most expertise were foreigners, Europeans, Indians, Chinese, because they had, they were becoming the people that we went to who were hired. <laughs> so the American education system has failed in many, many ways for the American students. I would agree. I would agree. I mean, I see that. I see that right now. Whereas I work with kids from <clears throat> India, say they're they're just they come in even people and and the Europeans in many ways when when they fled Hungary and when I came, they were the scientists in, in the hospital and 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 in the because uh, they had all these scientific degrees. And they came and worked in the hospital labs with us. And we didn't have Americans doing that. Hmm. So the education and their education, and they actually looked down on us because our education, they did they had to whatever they, their degrees were, you probably know it was they went, they didn't have to go to college, they were all graduated into the the, the different schools. And they came out and they knew all this, you would go to them with all the calculations. They would do it instantly. Hmm. They were much better qualified because of the education system. Our education system has created this yeah. in many, many ways. Yeah, that's, I, I would entirely agree. It's also like. And I see it and it's because I work with the different cultures, especially the Germans. When we had German people um, coming into the lab, or uh, initially, first it was Europeans, then it became Chinese. Like now in our lab, it's almost all Chinese. Mm -hmm. And they could, they're very smart. Yeah. 